allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus the Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank God. chapter 10 <clears throat> Acts chapter 10 and I know you read ahead and you're a good Bible student and you showed up tonight just to rehearse it what you've already read isn't God good? God is such an awesome and such a mighty God until he has blessed us to read ahead and prepare for tonight because God is just that kind of God Acts chapter 10, we're at verse 39, and we'll do 39 through 43 on tonight, verses 39 through 43. Very short passage that ends this particular pericope, but it is action-packed. It is full, it is packed with action, amen? amen? This should become somebody's greatest verses, greatest pericope on tonight. This is an action pack for a few verses, but it's got a whole heap to say. Amen? So we come now hearing from the Lord. We want God to speak to us. Let me bring you up to, to speed to where we are and how we get to verse number 39. Well, last week we talked about uh, Peter coming to Cornelius' house to share the word of God. And Cornelius had a house full of folk. Kind of like what we don't have here tonight. Cornelius had a house full of folk and he had invited people and, and the Bible said there was no small gathering. They came to hear the word of God from the man of God and it was no small gathering. So Cornelius had Peter over and he wanted Peter to talk to the people about the word of God and so he sets an example of how we ought to have church. We ought to invite folk to come to church. Yes? We ought to invite people to come, and when we invite them to come, we ought to welcome them. And when we invite people to come to church, we ought to make sure that the church is full. <clears throat> so they met in house church during those days. They had church from house to house. They were fellowshipping. They were breaking the bread. They were hanging out together. They loved spending time with each other. And so this is no different on tonight when Cornelius had all these people come to his house. And look at verses 34 through 38 and see what brings us up to verse number 39. The Bible says, Peter stood and he opened his mouth. He stood and he started talking about the word of God. And when he opened his mouth, he opened his mouth with something to say about God. He talked about God, he talked about Jesus. He says that, that in truth, I perceive that God has shown us that we, that he has no partialities. He has no discrimination. God has no um, things that he would do that would be different from anybody else. God has no partiality. He said God is, is uh, equal in what he does. He is equal. God does not show any partiality when it comes to hearing and obeying and blessing us through his word. So Peter says, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Why does Peter say this? No favoritism. Why does people, why is it a need for Peter to say God shows no partiality? He said, I perceive it. Why did he say that? Who's talking? He had a vision. What about his vision? That what happened? All kind of beasts, and the Lord told him to rise up and eat, and he was like, he didn't want to eat anything that was unclean. Mm -hmm. it never gone in his mouth. Okay. So what does food got to do with partiality? 
God says, whatever I call clean, don't you call unclean. Okay, so what does eating has to do with him having no partiality among people? It wasn't about the food, right? Yes, ma'am. He was talking about the Gentiles. He was talking about Gentiles, and he compared it to food. Go ahead. I was just saying that he was uh, talking about the Gentiles who were considered unclean by the Jewish people. Okay, so the Jewish people were up in it, right? They, they, they thought that God only, kind of like folk think these days, God only speaks to this denomination. God only speaks at this particular location. And if you're not in this church or in this denomination, you're going to hell. Can you believe people even think like that? This is this amazing, awesome God. And people are limiting him to a denomination that just started a few years ago. And they are bold with it. Now we have this new fella on the block, the, the uh, black Israelites, and now they're saying, you, you doing things all wrong, and they just showed up. So what happened to all the people that worship God that were not black Israelites? What happened to all the people that worship God that were not Baptists or not Methodists? God has no respect to a person. God is not one who has favoritism. God is not one who has partiality. God is an equal opportunity God. And the opportunity is given strictly through his son, Jesus Christ. Everybody has that opportunity. And before the world is over, everybody will have that opportunity. And as we read ahead in Revelation, we'll find out after all these tribulations take place, there are going to be some people that still won't accept it. Matter of fact, there will be two witnesses that will be witnessing about God, and they're going to kill those rascals. My, my, my. Of all the stuff that people go through, some people just won't turn to God. And God is so rich in mercy. He has no partiality. So Peter stands, he opened his mouth, he talks about the fact that God has no partiality, and he addressed every nation, every nation that does these two things, every person, whosoever do, does these two things, fear God, work righteously, and accept, I said too, and is accepted by God by him. So you do these two things, fear God, work righteously, then you accept it by God. God has already laid out the plan. Fear God, work righteousness, God accepts you. The word which God sent to the children of Israel is the same word that we preach. And that word is peace through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He's Lord of all. He's Lord over all. And Jesus Christ is the one that Peter is talking about. Have you ever seen a teacher or a preacher stand and they're supposed to be talking about Jesus and never mention him? Or they talk about Jesus and just, or they talk about everything else and just tag Jesus on the end. And the people go and they leave with incitement and says, he sure did preach today. I was at a funeral some years ago and the preacher got up and I was just sitting there like, huh? He started preaching. He's there to encourage the family. And he stood up and started talking about food and tithes and offering. And he beat those people up with tithes and offering right there at the film. Now that's when God says there's a time and a place for everything. First of all, he wasn't the pastor of all those people. 
Secondly, he did not address the occasion. And one thing you're taught is to address the occasion. Deal with what the occasion is. If the occasion is tithes and offer, deal with tithes and offer. If it's a funeral, it is your responsibility to, to encourage the people to come to Jesus. That's why we have funerals. We, we come to celebrate, and we talk about celebrating, and, and many times people don't do anything that, that deals with celebrating. And then it's our responsibility to call them to fellowship with Jesus Christ. Call them to obey the, the Savior that has saved us. Call them to get to know him. And I said to myself, even as a young preacher, what a wasted opportunity. He just blew it. He blew it and he expect people to agree with how he did. So I was sitting in the pulpit and I, it came to the end of the message and I was just determined to tell the people something about Jesus. I mean, I just, I was just determined. And as he kept talking, I stood up and I slowly eased up to the lectern. Very gently, very slowly. Until I slowly nudged him behind the lectern and away from the lectern. And I talked about that Jesus is coming back. The same Jesus that died on Calvary. The same Jesus that, that they buried. The same Jesus that rose from the dead. We have to make sure that people understand that Jesus is Lord of all. Peter stood and he said, Jesus is Lord of all. And then he said, this is the word that you already know. This is the word that you know. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout Judea. You already know it because it's been proclaimed. How often do preachers and teachers go to seminary and Bible school and then they come back to teach and preach the same gospel? My degree costs more than $30,000, just one of them. Sister Brown, just one degree cost more than $30,000. Boy, I could have done a lot of things with $30,000. One degree. You know how many hats and shoes Sister Davis could have brought, bought with $30,000? You know how many musical instruments that she could have bought with $30,000? You know what the church could have done with $30,000? One degree, Brother Miles, costs thirty more than $30,000. And guess what? After I finished that degree, I came back the next Sunday to teach and preach the same gospel that over 2,000 year, years ago, a man died on a tree between two thieves. Mean men killed him. They buried him in a bar tomb. He rose from the dead with all power in heaven and earth. The same gospel I was preaching before my degree, I came back and preached it again. Isn't that something? Spend all that money and come back and tell the same story. And the thing about it is we ought to tell the same story. Jesus is Lord of all. It's the word which you know, and it's also the word that's been proclaimed even to you in all Judea. And it begins from Galilee. After the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. John baptizes Jesus, the dove the, the spirit descends upon him as a dove. The father speaks from heaven and said, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. God talks about Jesus the way my mama can't talk about me. She may want to say great things about me, but at the end of the day, I don't compare to Jesus. And God, God in heaven can say about Jesus, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. God anointed him. Jesus says in Isaiah, I have been anointed to preach the gospel, to set at liberty the captives. I've been anointed to, 
to bandage up the, the wounded. He goes on to say, Peter goes on to say, the Holy, with the Holy Spirit, he was anointed and he was anointed with power. He was anointed with power who went about doing good and healing. Regardless if people didn't like Jesus, they had to admit one thing, he went about doing good. He went about doing good, he went about healing men, women, boys and girls, of not just the physical, but the emotional. Not just the emotional, but also of the spiritual. Jesus went about, went about doing good. Preacher preached a sermon called, Be a Do-Gooder. You need to become a do-gooder. You need to become somebody that's, that's known for doing good. My question to you tonight, what will your legacy be when you leave here? Will people know you as a do-gooder? Will they know you as a bad, bad doer? Will they know you as somebody that just passed by and, and didn't bother people, people didn't bother them, and, and they were just a good old boy doing a good old thing? Or will they know that you made your mark when you go? When you go, will people know that you've even been here? The Bible says that when Jesus left, they knew that he was a do-gooder. And not only did they know that he was a do-gooder, he went about doing good and he was healing people. And he set at liberty those who were oppressed by the devil. Those who were oppressed by the devil, he was healing them. Because many times when people are oppressed by the devil, they need a healing. They, they, need, they need somebody to heal them. Jesus was a do-gooder. For God was with him. And it just keeps coming up in our messages, in our teaching, in our Sunday school. You want God to be with you. God, if I go, don't let me go without you. Matter of fact, God, go ahead of me. Pay the road. Make the crooked places straight and tear down every hill and molehill and make it flat. You want God to go with you and God to be before you. You want God to be with you. The Bible says, for God was with him. The God that we know was with him. Do you want God with you or you just want to continue to make it on your own? Now, in fact, God, I, I can handle it from you. I mean, anytime you told God, whether in word or deed, God, I got this. God trying to tell you, I got this, and you telling God, God, I got this. I don't need you from here. That's why I always tell people, don't let your blessing become your curse. Those things we pray, for which we pray, then they become our, our curse. We spend some time praying for a person to get a job. We just want that person to have a job. And the person came to Sunday school, Bible study one night and she said, y'all need to pray for me to get this job. Y'all want me to get this job. This job, and this was many years ago, this job pays $72,000. This church need me to get this job. I said, oh, okay. The way I took it, she was making a promise. <laughs> I said, yeah, we sure do. We want you to get this job, baby. Get this job. Lord, give it to her. Because she said the church want her to get this job. Sister Brown, she said the church want her to have this job. And I'm praying, Lord, let her have it. And when, once she received the job, I'm telling you, I saw with my own eyes that her blessing became her curse. Number one, she started volunteering to work on Sunday. Now, she got a job that was paying three times more than what she was making. Now, let me just stop and tell you, just because you make more money don't mean that you have more expenses. Let me go get this. Let me go get this. Let me go charge it. She said, Lord, so the first mistake she, she made was her blessing became her curse 
in the fact that she stopped honoring God. Now let me tell you this. Now she told us, pray for me. You want me to have this job. She was even bold enough to say, hey, this is how much I'm going to make. Now you know the first thing comes to the pastor's mind, Pastor Mo. You know the first thing comes to the pastor's mind? She said that she's going to make 72000 We already calculating. 72,000, 7,200 divided by 12, divided by 62 or 52. Oh, man, we want you to have this job. And she shows up at the end of the year with $300.42 given to the church, Sister Richard. Her blessing became her curse. Don't let your blessing become your curse. Don't let your, 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 your blessing become something that even the church regret praying for you and concern. Because the God we, we serve, he doesn't have to pay us back through money. I mean, good health. You can have all the money in the world and not have good health. You, you, you're doing pretty badly. Look, so he says, Peter stood and he preached Jesus and he talked about how Jesus set at liberty those who were oppressed by the devil. And he goes on in Acts chapter 10, verse 39 is where we are tonight. He says, and we are witnesses of all things. Here's this apostleship shows up. This apostleship shows up again. Peter says, those of us who walked with him, those of us who was a part of his ministry, we were witnesses to what Jesus did. We were witnesses. We were not just witnesses to, to things that we heard about. We were eyewitnesses to things that we saw. Matter of fact, the things that we saw were all things. He says, we were witnesses to, of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. He said, we were witnesses. He's, and now he's about to flip the tape. He says, he said, we were witnesses to Jesus being a do-gooder. We were witnesses to Jesus healing people. We were witnesses to Jesus going about being anointed by the Holy Spirit, and after he was anointed, he went about doing good and setting the captives free. We were eyewitnesses to it. He said we were there and we were witnesses, and we saw that he was doing good in Jerusalem and the land of the Jews, and then he said, whom they killed hanging on a tree. He talks about all these great things that Jesus did. And after he talks about all these great things that Jesus did, he said he went from Galilee to Jerusalem to the land of the Jews, and he did good, but then they hung him on a tree. So they killed him. Mean men murdered him. They took his life for no reason. They let a terrorist go to kill Jesus. They let an insurrectionist go to kill Jesus. They made, they let a bomber go to kill Jesus. They let a man who deserved to die, who should have been sentenced to die, they let the rabbis go to take on Jesus and kill him. He says, whom they killed by hanging him, by hanging him on a tree. Whom he killed, they killed by hanging him on a tree. And when you look at uh, this word, these words hanging on a tree, it is a word called emodius. This word emodius means that it was a disgrace. It was a shame. Matter of fact, Paul says it was an accursed to hang a man on a tree. Crucifixion was so devastating. It was so cruel 
until no Roman would hang on a tree. They wouldn't kill their own that way. But they humiliated Jesus. They hung him on a tree. It was a curse that Jesus was hung on a tree because it was a curse for any man to hang on a tree. He says they killed him and hung him on a tree. What, what is this tree they talking about? What's the name of this tree? What is it, the sycamore tree? What tree is it? It's the cross. They hung him on a tree. And you may have heard me say from time to time, they hung him on a tree. They hung him on a cross. They hung him on a stake. They hung, hung him on a stick. All of the above. They humiliated Jesus who didn't deserve it. They hung my Lord on a tree. They killed him by nailing him tight to a tree. Crucifixion was awful. They would nail you on a tree and they would they would um, they would put your legs on a on a platform. And you your legs were on a platform and you would have to push up to breathe because your lungs are filling up with stuff. They killed him on a tree. And then to verify that he was dead, they pierced him in his side. And that's from which our salvation comes. What came out of his side? Blood and water came out of his side. And that's why we sing the song today. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood that came streaming down from Jesus' side. If we are saved, we are saved because of the blood of Jesus. They hung him on a tree. They killed Jesus on Calvary. They murdered him for no real reason on the tree. Look at the next verse. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 10, verse number 40. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Who is him? Jesus. The same Jesus that they killed on the tree. The same Jesus that died on Calvary. The same Jesus that they murdered for no apparent reason. They took him off the tree, took him off the cross, laid him in a barbed tomb. He stayed dead for three days. Peter says, him. Him was raised. It sounds like baby talk, doesn't it? Him, him, him hit me. Him hit me, mama. Him, him hit me. Him ran over me. Him ran over me. Him, God raised up on the third day. And when he raised him up, he showed him openly. What does he mean? What is he talking about? He raised him up. What is he talking about? What, what does it mean when you say he raised him up? What does it mean when he, I said he raised him up? He brought him back to life again. The word for raised or rose is roused. He was roused. He woke up again. Now let me tell you, even though he woke up, even though he got up, he was all the way dead. He was dead dead. He wasn't in a slumber. People have the slumber spirit, the slumber theory out there. And the slumber theory says that Jesus was just asleep. He wasn't asleep. He was all the way dead. No heartbeat dead. No blood to every extremity of the body dead. No intake of air dead. No exhale of air dead. He was still all the way dead. Peter says, Peter's talking in this house. And Cornelius' house, he says, it was that same him that was dead that God raised up on the third day. Okay, now this is the answer y'all trying to give me. Showed him openly. I hadn't gotten there yet. I just read it. Boy, I about five people hollering. That mean he showed him? Okay, now, what does it mean when I say, when I say showed him openly? Jesus saw him alive, walking around. 
People saw him alive, walking around. Anybody else? What do we? Where, where does where does the apostle Paul tell us that? Where? Where does he tell us that? I know the good Bible students in here gonna answer that one. Where does the apostle Paul? Clue is it's apostle Paul. So we know if it's apostle Paul, maybe it's in Romans, maybe it's in First, Second Corinthians, maybe maybe it's in Ephesians, maybe it's in Galatians, maybe it's in. Where does, where, does, where, does, where does Paul tell us? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 9, right quick like. It's Apostle Paul, so we know it's in, in one of his epistles, right? One of his letters to the churches. The church of Ephesians, or the church of, of Corinth, or the, or the church in Rome. He's writing letters. So let's stop at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. Paul is speaking. And as Paul is speaking, Paul says, I have presented unto you the gospel. The same gospel by which I preach is the same gospel by which you are saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, this is the gospel. He gets to verse number 3. He says, how Jesus died according to the scripture. He's laying out the gospel. The gospel is good news. I, I told you a few days ago that, that news reporters in Houston ought to be devastated when they get our word. News reporters in Houston ought to either need the Bible or drink of both when they get our word. Because they, they have delivered bad news all night long. All day long. I mean, on channel, channel 13, they start at 4 o'clock in the morning delivering bad news and don't go back off until 4 o'clock the next morning. So 24 hours, they delivering bad news. And guess what? You can turn to any station and you can hear bad news. And sometimes it's not the same bad news. It's worse and worse and worse and worse. Paul says... I have presented unto you the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, and this gospel is good news. And it is the same good news by which I have delivered unto you. It's the same good news by which you are saved. And he says in verse number 3, in the beginning of this good news is that Jesus died according to the scripture. They killed him. Peter is saying in Acts chapter 10, mean men killed him. Then Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he goes on and said, not only that Jesus died, he was buried after they killed him. Then he goes on to say, not only was he buried, he rose from the dead, according to the scriptures. He rose from the dead. He says, this same Jesus, they killed on a tree. They killed on Calvary. They killed on a cross. They killed him. They buried him. But to God, he says, him. Acts chapter, chapter 10, verse number 39, he says, him. Verse number 40, he says, him. The same him that they killed, God raised him from the dead. Verse number 38, it says him. The same him, the same Jesus that men killed, God raised him from the dead. And if you keep on reading, it says, and he showed him openly. First Corinthians chapter 15. What does it say in verse number five? First Corinthians chapter 15. Verse number five. What does it say? They can't hear you back there. Because I can't hear you up here. My, my, my. He was seen by Cephas. He was seen by Cephas. Who is Cephas? Peter. Peter. Is it a different Peter that's talking? No. So Peter is an eyewitness. Remember, Peter is an eyewitness. He says it is seen by Peter. Seen by Cephas. Then what does it say? Then it was seen by the twelve. Was Judas part of the twelve? No. 
Was Judas part of the twelve? No. You said that with great confidence, sir. <laughs> he said Judas was not a part of the twelve. Sister Davis Davis, he said that Judas was not a part of the twelve. Brother Miles, would you care to elaborate on when Judas was a part of the twelve and how why he's not a part of this twelve? Well, Judas uh, departed after betraying Jesus. Okay. And went out and hung himself. Judas went out and said, I'm, I'm done with this life. But he was a taught part of the 12 disciples, right? Yeah. And one of the 12 disciples went out and, and did himself in, right? So his name was Judas. Sister Bernie, why did Judas go out and do himself harm? Why would Judas go and when the autopsy came out, they said death by suicide. Why did Judas do that to himself? Hmm? He regret turning Jesus over to the soldiers, right? So Sister Brown, how did he turn him over to him? How did what did what did Judas do to give an indication of that this is Jesus? He kissed him. Good God Almighty, watch who you kiss. <laughs> and watch who kissing you. I think I'll bring that out one Sunday. <laughs> watch who, boy, the moment I said my, my, my subject, they're going to be like, yeah. Watch who's kissing you. Be careful who's kissing you. Now, Jesus knew why he was kissing him, right? Because he had just done the Lord's, the, the communion, the Lord's Supper. He had just done the communion. And he says, the one that does what? That's the one that's going to turn me over. The one who does what? Wait a minute now. Dips in the cup, right? We're talking about communion, remember? We're talking about communion. The one who dips after I dip in the cup, that's the one that's going to turn me over. Okay, now who denied Jesus at the fireplace? Peter. Peter, this same Peter? This same preaching Peter. Boy, that makes me feel so good, Sister Richards, that even though I messed up before, I can still stand and preach the gospel. It reminds us that it's not, we're not called to be Christians. We're not called to be preachers or teachers. We're not called to be disciples because of how good we've been. I mean, that's good news to me. <laughs> it is good news because I know I was messed up. And God still chose me. I know I was struggling. And God still chose me. I knew I had denied Jesus. See, some people think that Peter is the only one that denied it. So, Woods, how do we deny? Do we deny are we better than Peter? How do we deny him? Anybody who's talking? How do we how do we deny Jesus? Peter said Peter said these words, just like people at the church say, "I will never leave you. I'm gonna be with you, Jesus. I'm gonna be here to support you." And Jesus said, "Before in the morning, before the roost." Now, what happens in the morning? The first thing that happens in the morning. While the dew is yet on the ground, the rooster crows, and guess what? Three times Peter had, oh, cussing Peter, oh, lying Peter, oh, denying Peter. You know what that says to us? Regardless of how deep in the gutter we go, God's grace can still use us. Regardless of how bad things have gotten for us and, and how we have denied Jesus, God can still use us. Peter denies him. Judas betrays him. We deny him and betray, betray him. And God still uses us. Because if you're still breathing, God is still wanting to use you. If you're still walking around, if if you're still if you're still in your right mind, God wants to use you. 
There was a movie, I, I don't remember the name, Denzel Washington was a police officer. He was laying in the bed using a stick in his mouth the whole time. And he was commanding people to go here and telling them what to do and, and telling them where to catch the bad guy. He was in the bed and somebody got mad at him one day and come and pulled him out the bed on the floor and threw him on the floor. I'm telling you, as long as you have breath in your body, as long as you are walking, as long as you are sleeping and getting up in the morning, God can use you. Denzel Washington was the brilliant mastermind, but he couldn't walk. But he was telling everybody what to do. He was controlling the computer with his stick in his mouth. God wants to use you. Peter, God wants to use you. Judas, God can use you. Don't do it to yourself, Judas. Leave it alone, Judas. The devil, the, the few verses above that says Jesus healed them who were, con who were oppressed by the devil, who were convinced by the devil, Jesus delivered them. Don't give up on God. God still want to use you. Verse 40 says, Him God raised from the dead and showed him openly. When we in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see it. And as we see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that it says that he was seen by Cephas, by Peter. He was seen by the 12. Brother Miles said Judas wasn't there. If Judas wasn't there, who was there? Who was that person that made up the 12? Who? Matthias. 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 Matthias, right? How did Matthias get on the team? Where he come from? I hadn't even heard about the brother. He just showed up at church one Sunday and they said, you hit. <laughs> so how did, how did they get It's like, <laughs> I told you before, I, I went to the church and preached one Sunday and went back to support another brother preaching the next Sunday. And the brother that, get, that joined church the Sunday I was there was up there on the deacon boat. He was a deacon in seven days. Now here Matthias come and, and now he's a disciple. The Bible said he openly showed himself to the twelve. So how did they do it during that, during that day? How did they select people during that day? Who wants to tell me? By casting lots. By casting lots. Now that's a word that I never understood. What is a casting of lots? <laughs> How did they cast lots? They cast lots several ways, right? You, you, you got a handful of straws. You pull the straw. You can't see the bottom of the straw, right? So you pull the straw and you, you pull the, the short straw and the long straw. Another way, Sister David said, they were doing what she grew up doing, cast, casting dice. Can't you see Sister David growing up, up on the hill in South Haven, Mississippi, back there on Swinging Road? And, and see calling Katie. Katie! <laughs> Come on, snake eyes! Somebody else rolls, she break them, break them off the table. Katie, out there casting lights. Every now and then it gets hot in the room, she starts messing with a bank. It's hot in here. Katie! They cast lots, right? So they, they, some, and then when Jesus died on Calvary, how did they get, decide who going to take his clothes? Hmm? They cast lots. They cast lots. They gambling on Calvary. They gambled on Calvary. So, so when we look at it, it said, him God raised from the dead the third day and he showed himself openly. Showed him openly. Showed Jesus openly. In other words, not only did he show him to Peter, not only did he show him to the twelve, then you keep reading as you get close to verse number nine, it said he showed him to how many people at one time? Five hundred folk at one time. Peter said we were eyewitnesses. We saw him. Showed him to, our, we were eyewitness. He showed him to over 500 men at one time. Verse 9 says, Paul says, show him to me. An apostle out of two seasons. 
Last night I was teaching in one Texas, right? I was teaching and got to that point where I was saying that you don't have to be a preacher to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a preacher or a teacher to tell people about Christ. You can evangelize without a title. And I said, well, you don't have to be an apostle. You don't have to be a, a prophet. You don't even have to be a pastor. And as I got through teaching, the pastor got up and said, I want to recognize apostles such and such in the back. <laughs> I said, oh my God. <laughs> and he said, hey, can I come to your church? Sure, why wouldn't you? Come on down. Come on on this side of town. The apostle was in the house. And he didn't look like he was 2,000 years old either. The apostle was in the house. But the apostle Paul says, there is a man who, who was out of due season an apostle, and that man was me. Who want to tell me what due season or out of due season was Paul referring to? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 9. Is it in verse number 9? What does it say in verse number 9? What does it say in verse number 9? For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Okay. Anybody else? Verse number 9. I am called to be an apostle. I'm, I'm an apostle out of due season. Hmm? It was his time, obviously. What does it mean about out of due season? Out of due season. I'm an apostle. Verse eight. Verse eight. Okay, let's see. Let's hear verse eight. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due season. Born out of due season, or apostle out of due season. What is he talking about? Why did he put that in there? Did, did Paul put that in there just to Feel the page up? What do mean, due season? He wasn't with the original. Um, that's right. He was not with the original disciples. That's correct. What else does he mean? Uh, Say again. God had chosen him for specific things, and that was to bring the Jews home. Okay, so God had chosen, chosen the Apostle Paul for a specific work. He brought the Gentiles and the Jews together. He he planted churches. What else does he talk about when he say due season? Out of the time that apostles were being called. Oh, so during this time, when Paul says out of due season, there are no more apostles being called, but God called him to do this specific work that we talk about, right? Out of due season. So, Brother Miles, when did he bring this season in again? I know you know the answer to this, Brother Miles. He did not bring the season in. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did we get all these, Sister Whitlock, how did we get all these apostles? They made that decision. Brother Miles said God didn't bring the, the season back in. They made that decision on their own. They? The person that's called himself. Oh, the apostles did. The apostles. All right. So if 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 I'm an apostle, you know I'm I'm big shot. Y'all think I'll be calling? Y'all need to start calling me the apostle. I even, before I even ask the question, she was shaking her head. Oh no, no, don't even don't even drop of it. <laughs> he said, Paul says I'm an apostle out of due season, right? Verses nine and eight and nine, First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verses eight and nine. He says, "I'm an apostle out of good, out of due season, after the season of the apostleship was over." Let's look back at Acts chapter ten. Acts chapter ten, verse forty. Him God raised from the from the dead. Now him that is hanging on the tree, him God raised from the dead. The third day, him the one who showed him open. They showed him openly. Not to all of the people. Check this out. He said, we were eyewitnesses. But everybody didn't see it. God has a special message just for you. 
And you know the thing about it is, we want God to give me that message right now. God, look, now you've been waiting too long to tell me what you want me to do. Do it now. Anybody in the house? I mean, God, you know, you're going to tell me, go on, tell me. Why are you waiting to tell me? That's why our faith steps in, right? That's where our faith motivates us to keep going. The question is, what's motivating you to keep going? My faith, my faith motivates me. I'm going to trust God. I am going to trust God until the day I die. And I have to show it in my action as well as in my words. I'm going to trust him. Now, trusting him in this human body is not easy. Walking with him is not the thing that's the fad of the day. But we got to trust. You know, God is so wise and, and awesome in his wisdom until God knows what we need, when we need it, how we need it, any way we need it. He's God. And it's okay for us to tell him, God, now, I'm getting weary now. God, I need you to come on here. Lord, I need you. I need you right now. But our faith, our courage is built. Our, our perseverance is built. Our character is built on our faith. I've said to this church several times, if we're not going to walk in faith, things that we don't see, if we're not going to trust God through it, we might as well shut the doors, put club on the outside, take the sign down, put club up there. No more New Beginning Church. No more NBC. Put club out there. Shut the doors and go to hell in style. We got to have faith. And if we see something, there's no need for faith. But as we walk in faith, we don't even see where we're going. And many times, it doesn't make sense to us how God has taken us through. It just doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. I mean, doesn't make sense. My daughter came to me and said, I'm going to be a police officer. That didn't make sense to me. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> Sister Davis, Davis, that did, didn't make sense to me. So I said, like, what? Why you want to do that? I want to say, what are you doing that for? <laughs> it didn't make sense to me, but her answer was, I want to help people out. So, well, you know, you, you can be a nurse and help folk out. <laughs> you can be an engineer and help folk out. <laughs> we spend all this time and money on engineering and all of a sudden, policing? Then to me, it didn't make sense. But to her, she's very successful at it. I mean, she's good at it. I mean, she's She's getting motivated to it. I mean, that's what she likes to do. I mean, I mean, 18 hours a day she likes it so much. Now that doesn't make sense to me either. When God is using us, when God is doing things with us, when God is doing things through us, it doesn't make sense. But we have to let God be God. And when we let God be God, Peter says to them, he didn't show himself to all people. He showed himself to us who were our witnesses. And we were the ones that were chosen by God. Have you been chosen by him? Maybe, just maybe, God has chosen you. 100% chance God has chosen you. For whatever you're going through, no one could go through it like you. And we're saying, now, God, you could have chosen somebody else for this journey. God has chosen us. And he chose us. He himself chose us. He says, but to witness, but to witnesses chosen before by God. And God chooses us before time. He chooses us when we think about this thing, God chooses us further down the road. 
We right now, we living in the right now, you know, people now, they, that's what they say. Be here now. Live in the right now. While we're living in the right now, God is choosing our future. And we just have to follow the roadmap that God has chosen. Before God, even to us who ate and drank with him. Who's he talking about? Those who ate and drank with him. He's talking about the disciples that ate and drank with him. He's talking about the apostles. The apostles in due season apostles. Brother Miles said after apostleship was over, then, then, then Paul was selected. We ate with him. We drank with him. And we did it after he rose. He's still telling us that he showed himself openly. God showed Jesus after he raised him from the dead. He showed him publicly. After he rose from the dead. Verse 43. And he was commanded. And he commanded us to preach. Commanded us to preach to the cows. Yes. Commanded us to preach to the dogs. He commanded us to preach to the people. Man that was created a little lower than the angel. He commanded us to preach to people. And he commanded us. Now this is for those who are not preachers. And he commanded us to testify. That it is he. Who was ordained by God to be judged. Jesus. Has been ordained by God. To be the judge. You know young folks. That don't judge me. Now they got a new scripture. They going to call your attention to. Only Jesus can judge me. <laughs> but sometimes you don't have to make a judgment call. You just become a fruit inspector. And when you are a fruit inspector. You just look at the fruit. Jesus was ordained by God. To be judged. Of the living and of the dead. Jesus is going to judge both the living and the dead. To who? To him. All the prophets witnessed that. Through his name. Whoever believes in him. Will receive redemption of sin. Remission of sin. Salvation from sin. When you when you meet a cancer patient and they tell you my my cancer is in remission, what does that mean? Free from cancer. Free from cancer. It also means there's no more detection. You can go to the doctor every six months, every year. And when you go there, they say, I don't see it anymore. Woo, good God Almighty. We have the remission of sin through Jesus Christ. Whoever believes, anybody who believes, and what do they have to believe in? In him. Not only can I preach about watch who kiss you, I can preach about in him. Our salvation, our remission of sin, our deliverance from sin, our redemption from sin is through him. Our hope is through him. Our strength is through him. Our faith is through him. It's through him we live. It's through him we have our being. It's in him we have strength. Is all about him. And if you just trust him. He not only will deliver you from the remission of sin. He will walk with you and talk with you. And he will remind you that you belong to him. Trust in him. Somebody tonight need to trust in him. The door of the church is open. Amen. The invitation is extended. Just trust him. The one who died on Calvary. Peter says, 
He was killed. He was buried. And God raised him. The word raised means he was roused. Some say he was aroused from the dead. If you never received Jesus as your personal Savior, I say to you as Peter says, you need to trust in the story. The story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, he says, if you can believe that Jesus died, believe it in your heart. Trust it. Confess it with your mouth. That Jesus was raised from the dead. You can be saved. John chapter 3, 16 says that God loved the world. God gave his only one of a kind begotten son. His only unique son, God gave him. That the world through him might be saved and would not perish. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 declares that you can just believe the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And God showed him openly. And that you can be saved right here, right now. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. Just trust him. Bow your head with me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you're now saved, you're born again, if you trust this story of Jesus Christ. Now you need to be a part of a good Bible teaching church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. We welcome you to the New Beginning Church. Thank you for joining us here tonight for Bible study at 715 every Wednesday night. Also, please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. We have Spanish Sunday school class at 9 a.m. We have a youth Sunday school class at 9 a.m. We have English speaking adult Sunday school class at 9 a.m. every Sunday. Please join us. And also join us at 10.30 a.m. for worship service where we worship the King of King and the Lords of Lord, Jesus the Christ. If you want to visit with us, please do so by joining us at 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048, USA. That's 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048, USA. Looking forward to seeing you on a Wednesday night or Sunday morning. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. If you want to give to the Lord, you can do so by giving electronically by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your offering, you can do so by mailing it to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. 
Are there any prayer requests or praise reports? Prayer requests or praise reports? Prayer requests or praise reports? Anybody? Has God been good to anybody today, this week, or this month? Yeah. So uh, prayer requests or praise reports. We want to we wanna be praying for the Trejo Malo family. We're praying for the Trejo and Malo, Malo family uh, in the transitioning of Sister Malo, Sister Trejo's uh, brother. So we're going to lift that family before the Lord. Amen. Do you have any other prayer requests? Why don't we stand to be dismissed? We're praying for Sister Lillian Darrington. We're praying for Sister Lillian Darrington that God will give her a speedy recovery. Amen. And God will continue to give her a speedy recovery. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for all that you are, all that you do, and how you handle our business. Now, Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to bless the Trejo family. Bless them in this time of bereavement, Father God. Bless this family to know you as God. And bless even this transition to be one that will draw people closer to him. We ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us. Bless Sister Lydia Darrington and heal her body, Father God, in a miraculous way. We ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with her. Give her comfort, give her peace. Lord, we pray for all those on our prayer list, Father God. Continue to walk with them and, and give them hope and give them strength. Lord, we thank you for our church. We ask you to continue to bless our church numerically through growth. We pray that you bless our church financially in growth. We pray, Father God, that you bless our church to continue to reach souls for Jesus the Christ. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Our mission and vision is... We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.